Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ana Montañez, and I am the Government Relations Manager here at Independent Sector. Um, for those of you who are joining us um, on an IS webinar for the first time, I want to welcome you. Um, Independent Sector is a national membership organization representing a diverse set of nonprofits, foundations, and corporate giving programs that are working to ensure that all people in the United States thrive. So as part of our webinar feature, all lines are currently muted and we will pause periodically for questions. Um, to ask questions, please um, type them in, a, in the Q&A box. Um, but before we start, I want to respectfully acknowledge that I am joining you today from Washington, D.C., which is the ancestral home of the Pascataway people um, who are still in the area and working to reclaim their land and traditional practices. I also want to acknowledge that many of the buildings and places we inhabit in Washington are built, um, well, were built by enslaved people. Um, and, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, today, um, we have a special policy update. Um, Today, uh, this policy update is open to um, IS members and, and anyone who is not an IS member. And so, as many of you um, know, because you registered for this, um, the first portion of um, our webinar today is going to be dedicated to the recent changes that the Department of Education has, um, has been implementing to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And then the second portion of um, the webinar will be dedicated to our usual um, policy update. So without further ado, I want to um, introduce um, our panelists that are going to be um, with us today. So today I'm joined by Wes Cullum and Jessica and Cameron, um, which are trusted partners at Washington Council Ernst & Young and by Ashley Harrington, which is the Senior Advisor to the Chief of Operating Officer at the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Federal Student Aid. So we all know as nonprofit employees and also employers and the importance of having a diverse uh, workforce. Um, and, and we also know that our sector sometimes have issues with compensation and that in order to attract great talent, um, uh, a lot of our folks and, and workforce relies on, re rely on the PSLF program. And so we wanted to, to, to bring you all some great information about the, the recent changes um, to the PSLF program. So without further ado, Ashley, please take it away. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you um, to uh, Independent Sector for having us today um, and for all of you for joining. I'm really excited to share this information, really excited about everything that we're doing um, from around PSLF and a number of issues just to make the student loan system work better. Um, we know that a lot of people are burdened, 44 million people are carrying over $1.6 trillion in student loans. And so we're doing a lot to alleviate that. And we're and this is just the beginning. We only scratched the surface and all that we are trying to do. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about some updates to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. I hope that this will be very helpful for you in terms of many of you may have student loans, you may work with a lot of folks within your own staffs and organizations that have student loans. And you will also work with a lot of, um, if you work with grantees and other organizations who have student loans. So many of your organizations are gonna be eligible employers and you're working with eligible employers. And so we are not just help asking to share this information with you, but we're really asking for your help in getting the word out because you're gonna hear that um, part of this waiver is time limited. And so we are in this full sprint um, to get as many people enrolled in PSLF and to take the steps they need to take before October 31st, 2022, because that's when this time limited waiver ends. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen and talk a little bit about PSLF normally, how it normally works. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, talk a little bit about the waiver, um, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. Can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. 
So we're doing this thing called limited PSLF waiver. And before I tell you what that is, I want to make sure you know that it has had a tremendous impact already. Um, since October of last year, we have already approved over $8 billion in forgiveness for over 144000 through this limited PSLF waiver. For context, before, this, before October of last year, only 7,000 people had been approved for PSLF forgiveness total. So this has been a game changer. This has been a really big deal. And in addition to those borrowers who have gotten forgiveness, another 1.1 million have gotten closer to forgiveness with the average borrower picking up an additional year's worth of credit. That's an additional 12 months of credit towards 120 that's required for PSLF forgiveness. So this has been an extraordinary time. We are really seeing the impact um, for, for real people. These are tangible benefits. People are seeing their lives changed um, by this waiver and it's very exciting. Um, so just a re re refresher on how PSLF normally works. Under normal rules, you know, you make 120 qualifying payments on federal direct student loans while working for a qualifying employer when applying for and receiving PSLF. And at the end, whatever's left over is forgiven and that amount is not taxable. And so at FSA, we like to say you have to have the right loan with the right repayment with the right job. And so we'll dig into each of those pieces separately and then we'll talk about the waiver and what it changes. So the right loan, under normal PSLF, the eligible loan types are only direct loans. That does include consolidation loans and parent plus loans. So parent plus loans are a little bit different. If you have a parent plus loan or you work with borrowers with parent plus loans, um, they're slightly different. I'm not gonna go into depth about that today, but just know that parent plus borrowers just have to take some extra steps um, to access PSLF. Um, it doesn't include FEL program loans. Those are federal family education program loans. These are loans that are guaranteed by the federal government, but were originated by private companies like Sally Mae or Wells Fargo. It doesn't include Perkins loans. These are loans guaranteed by the federal government, but originated by institutions of higher education. And it doesn't include any federal or any other federal or private student loans. And you know, FEL program loans, when PSLF was created back in October of 2007 by Congress, the FEL pro portfolio was actually the bigger portfolio. We stopped making FEL loans in 2010, but there are still so many borrowers with FEL loans to this day who are still in repayment, um, who can't get, who under normal PSLF rules can't get access to PSLF. Now you can consolidate a FEL loan, but under normal rules, when you consolidate a FEL or a Perkins loan into the direct loan program, any time in repayment prior to that, whether you with, even if you were with a qualifying employer, doesn't count towards PSLF. You start at zero. Even if you had direct loans and you consolidated them, you started at zero on that new direct consolidation loan. Again, just a reminder of how normal PSLF works. You have to have the right repayment. So an eligible payment towards the 120 is one that is on time, made on a standard plan or any income-driven repayment plan has to be for at least the amount due, and they can be non-consecutive. This is really important. I get a lot of questions about this, like, what if I don't have the 10 years in a row? It doesn't have to be in a row. I like to say get to 120 however you can. It could take some borrowers 15 years. It could take some borrowers exactly 10 years. We don't care. You just have to get to 120. It can't be more than 15 days late. It can't be made on a graduated, extended, or alternative plan. It can't be for less than the amount due and it can't be made when not required. So if you're in school and your loans are deferred or you're in that grace period following um, being following um, going to school you, and you made a payment, those would not those do not count. So you have to have the right job. And we like to say it's about the employer. It's not about the job because we just want to know, are you working full time, which is 30 hours a week or the equivalent for us? at a government entity, so that's federal, state, local, tribal, or military. It includes all 501c3 nonprofits. It includes some other nonprofits if they provide a qualifying public service. So those are things like public safety, public health, emergency management, um, and, a, and a bunch, and a few more. It doesn't include part-time work unless it adds up to full-time and all of the employers are PSLF eligible employers doesn't include volunteer work. So if you're not getting paid, it doesn't count. It doesn't include any for-profit entities, even if you're doing similar work to people at a nonprofit or government agency or you employ essential workers. It doesn't include labor unions or partisan political organizations. There's also something called temporary expanded PSLF, which is uh, an appropriations created, um, appropriations um, program created by Congress that provides PSLF forgiveness for borrowers if they were on the wrong repayment plan. So if they were on extended or graduated plan instead of that standard or income-based repayment plan. 
So that's normal PSLF and TPSLF. And you may have heard terrible things about it in the past. You may have heard about the high rejection rates. I mentioned you only 7,000 borrowers had gotten forgiveness, even though borrowers should have been eligible for forgiveness as early as 2017 since it was created in 2007. And we know that. We know there's been miscommunication. We know people didn't know what type of loan they had to have. They didn't know what repayment plan they had to be on. Some people have been actively misinformed by their servicers or other folks they trusted. And so in October, we announced this thing called the limited PSLF waiver. And it's, we call it limited because it ends October 31st, 2022. After that date, PSLF will still exist and it will still function the way um, under normal rules, but this limited waiver that has helped all these borrowers get forgiveness and all these other borrowers get closer to forgiveness will be over. So the biggest thing it does is that payments made prior to consolidation are now eligible. So it gives credit for payments made on direct loans, fell loans, and Perkins loans, and for borrowers who have some of these older federal student loans that no one really talks about anymore, you can also get credit for those doesn't matter your repayment plan. So we don't care if you want a standard plan or extended plan or IDR plan. We're not looking at that. We just want to know if you're in active repayment status. So you can't have been in default. You can't have been on um, in school or in a grace period. Um, you can't have been um, in bankruptcy, but um, you can get credit for any time repayment, even if you missed a payment, even if you were late, even if it was not for the full amount due. Um, we're also even counting certain periods of forbearance and deferment, and we can talk about that later as well. But this is a game changer. This is how you get from 7,000 to more than 140,000. This is how you get to 1.1 million people with an average of 12 months of additional credit. So we don't care about your loan program. We're not looking at your repayment plan. We're not worried about the loan type either, with the exception of Parent Plus, because remember I told you it has slightly different rules. But if you've already consolidated, you can now get credit for the time prior to consolidation. If you haven't yet consolidated and you still have Fell or Perkins loans, you can consolidate now and get credit for those payments prior to or when it was still a Fell or Perkins loans. This is a big deal. So we didn't do anything about the employment rules. You still have to be full time for a qualifying employer or employers um, based on the rules that we just talked about. But the payment plan rules, the loan program rules, the loan type rules, those are the ones that have been waived. Those are the ones that are flexible. But borrowers who are gonna have to take steps, if they still have Feller Perkins loans, they have to consolidate into the direct loan program by October 31st, 2022. And every borrower has to submit at least one PSLF form, whether you're a Fell borrower, Perkins loan borrower, direct loan borrower, by October 31st, 2022, because we are asking that borrowers are effectively raising their hand and saying they are working towards PSLF to get the flexibilities of the waiver and they have to do it all by October 31st, 2022. Um, and so even if you're not at 120, even if you've only been in repayment for a year or two years, we are encouraging every single borrower who can take advantage of this, go ahead, get those forms in, consolidate if you need to, you can take advantage of these waivers, of this waiver. So again, you may fall in, borrowers may fall into one of three groups. They may only have direct loans and they just want to make sure they have a PSLF form on file, which is what, how you certify employment. We also, you also may hear me call it an ECF, employment certification form. If they've already consolidated into the direct loan program, they want to have forms on file for the time prior to consolidation. And if they still have Fell or Perkins loan, they need to consolidate and get a PSLF form in all by October 31st, 2022. So just to recap, take advantage of the waiver, confirm your employer is qualified. You can do that on studentaid.gov, which I'm going to show you next in our help tool. And right now you have to log in to get access to the help tool. But next month, we're actually going to have a standalone employer database. So borrowers won't even have to log into studentaid.gov. Employers can check their eligibility themselves and it will be freestanding, public facing without having to log in. So we're very excited about that as well. Consolidate loans if they need to submit a PSLF form, and do it all by October 31st, 2022. We also recently announced some changes to um, IDR that we're making a one-time IDR account adjustment that also is going to impact PSLF, and so I like to flag that as well. Um, so we're going to make a one-time account adjustment to account for long-term forbearances toward IDR and PSLF. So there were many borrowers who were steered into forbearances, even though they could have been on an income-based repayment plan and had a payment as low as $0. And so for borrowers who had forbearance of 12 months or more consecutive or 36 months or more cumulative, they can actually get credit towards IDR and PSLF. And we're going to automatically implement that later. For P later this year. For PSLF, you will still have to certify your employment. So for every period you're trying to get credit for for PSLF, you're going to have proof 
going to have to have corresponding um, certification that you were employed in a public service um, employer during that time. So you're still going to have to have to submit that, but we're doing that later this year. So that is also going to help a lot of borrowers get closer um, to forgiveness. So this is really exciting. Um, this is just one of the many things that we're doing, but this is time sensitive. So we are really just, uh, like I said, in that all out sprint to make sure everyone knows about the waiver and what they need to do. So this is the PSLF help tool landing page. You can find it at studentaid.gov slash PSLF, and the link is gonna be on the next page, don't worry. Um, this is where borrowers go to create their PSLF form, which is what they're gonna put in their employment that they have to then you know, sign and get signed by their employer and then submit. This is how they certify employment. This is right now where you log in and you'll be able to type in your employer's EIN, employer identification number, which you need for every single employer you're trying to certify. This is what's on your W-2 and on your pay stub. So borrowers can log in and begin filling out that form. Later this month, you will be able to access the database that's connected to the help tool without logging in, as I mentioned. Um, and so I will say, though, even when it's public and even right now, it's not an all exhaustive database. So we tell borrowers, even if your employer is not popping up or it says it may not be eligible or that it hasn't been determined, still continue with the process, complete the form, get everything done, because it just means that our system is not you know, it doesn't have every single employer that's PSLF eligible in the world, but we are constantly working to improve it and to make this process work for more borrowers. So this is just some resources that will give you more information because I know I gave a lot of information pretty fast and it's there's probably a lot of questions that are that you still have, but you can find the most up to date information at studentaid.gov slash PSLF waiver. You can find the help tool at studentaid.gov slash PSLF. And you can find um, the general information about PSLF at studentaid.gov slash public service. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we have time um, for some questions. Thank you, Ashley, for, for all that uh, very important information. Um, I'm sure that the, the audience, um, it's um, digesting all of that. And, and yeah, I see there are a couple of questions on the Q&A box and also on the chat. Okay. Um, so taking a look, so I see one about if you have payments counted and limited waiver, will they still be counted after the waiver ends? Absolutely. Once they're your, once they're credited to you, you don't lose them. So that's why we're telling everyone, go ahead and get your forms in, get your max count so you can continue working with PSF later. You, they will not go away just because the waiver ends, but you do have to raise your hand before the waiver ends. Um, I see a question about is credit being offered for forbearance? So that goes back to um, what we were saying about the long-term forbearance steering, and you can get credit for those periods if you had more than 36 months cumulative or 12 months or more um, consecutive. If you feel like you were steered into a shorter term forbearance, you will also be able to reach out to our ombudsman's office and, and, get, and, and get some help with that, and you can potentially get additional credit. Um, we are also granting credit for some military-related um, deferments and forbearances as well. So those are some of the pieces um, where um, you could get credit. Um, a question about for all, do you have to work for a qualifying public service entity for all those 120 payments? Yes, for every payment you're trying to get credit for, you have to be employed with a qualifying PSLF employer, but it doesn't have to be the same one. It doesn't have to be the same industry. You can switch jobs 50 times during the 120 payments. That doesn't matter. You just have to certify that for every single one of those months, you were working for a qualifying employer. Um, I will also say that one thing I forgot to mention for those of us, if you're on the payment pause right now, for many, for direct loan borrowers, we've had our payments pause since March of 2020. You can actually get credit for every single one of those months, even though we haven't been required to make payments, as long as you can still certify that you were employed by, your, by a PSLF eligible employer. I, I know I need to say that again, you can absolutely get credit for every single one of these months. No one ever believes me the first time I say it, so I try to say it twice, but yes, you can get all of these months that push you at least a fifth of the way towards 120 payments required for PSLF if you um, can show that you were employed for this entire period of the payment pause. Sorry. Um, 
So if you're, so this is a question about employer rejections or anybody get someone on the phone to speak to. So if you feel like your employer was denied and it was improperly denied, we actually have this new interim reconsideration process. Um, now we will send that link over as well, where you can um, um, send in an application to have it re, have it looked at again by our team and you can explain this wasn't right or I think I should have gotten credit. I think my employer should have been qualified and someone will take an, a, another look at that. If you've applied in the past and you've been denied because you didn't have the right loan or they sent it back, right? So many times you may have been denied simply because you didn't have the right loan. They could have sent it back. We didn't hold on to those. So you're gonna to have to resubmit. And for those of you who have had a prop, who have been discouraged in the past, we really are encouraging folks to try again. And we hope you will encourage others to try again because this is this is this these are game changers. And people who have never had success with PSLF are getting success. And people who, once we do their adjustments, they have, an, they have more than 120 payments on their account. They're actually getting refunds. They're getting refunds for those extra payments made on direct loans. They're getting refunds from the federal government for their student loan. So that's really exciting as well. I have a question about how consolidation of to a DL works if you have loans from two different periods of repayment. There are eligible payments on the first loan prior to taking out the second loan. How does consolidation affect those payments? So under the waiver, if you're consolidating loans that have different repayment periods, you're going to get at least the amount of qualifying payments for the oldest loan. If they don't overlap, you may get even more than that if there are like some on the newer loan that aren't on the older loan. So you're going to get at least the highest amount for that entire consolidation loan. So you definitely want to consolidate now because that means that um, unlike normally where you would start at zero, um, you're going to get the maximum amount for the entire consolidation loan, even the part that is a newer loan. This is only so if you, but if I will say if you have parent plus loans, the re, what we didn't get into is that you can get you can get PSL for parent plus loans that is based on the parent's employment. But um, to get income based repayment for parent plus loan, you have to consolidate so you can get income contingent repayment, which is the least generous of the income based plans. But if you have a direct consolidation loan with only an underlying parent plus loan, you're not going to get any additional credit under the waiver unless you also had another underlying loan, like a student loan. So you had your own parent plus loan and you consolidate with a student loan. You could get additional credit for the student loan, but not for the parent plus loan. Um, do I need to submit PSLF forms yearly for certification? We, we think that's the best practice, right? No one's required to submit a PSLF form yearly. You can wait to the very end. You have all 120 and you wanna submit them all then. But, we, but why wait? We encourage everyone to submit every year or every time they change jobs. That way it's easy, it's top of mind. You can easily get it signed by your employer. You don't have to worry about 10 years from now trying to find someone to sign a form. Just go ahead and submit a form every year. And then you can also um, watch your payment count go up and see the light at the end of the tunnel if you're repaying, when you're repaying your loans. Um, I went into repayment mode during COVID. I've been told while I'm not making payments right now to the government pause, this time is still counted as payments made. Absolutely, you just still have to certify your employment. I'm on PSLF and work 40 hours. If I went down to 30 hours, would it still count? Yes, because it's what your your if your employer is going to certify that you're working 30 hours a week or the equivalent of full time, you can get credit. Now I have a question about legislation. I'm going to leave to Wes. Talked a little bit about parent plus loans just now. For those of us for whom the system is not working, there's someone we can actually speak to. Um, yes, so you can call your current servicer. You can also call the PSLF servicer, which um, has been Fed Loan Servicing for, for years, but as of tomorrow will be Mohila, so they can help you. If you're still having trouble, you can talk to our ombudsman who will be joining in a few minutes, and you can reach out to them at studentaid.gov slash feedback, and they can help you as well. Hey, everybody, I'm on. Hey, Bonnie, if you could just um, drop that website in the chat, um, that would be great. Your servicer is changing, will this affect my status? No, um, because FIA is leaving the system, we are all, all PSLF borrowers are moving to Mohila. They are officially the servicer starting tomorrow and all PSLF borrowers will be transferred to Mohila by September of this year. And then I'm now, that was a chat, I'm gonna look in the Q&A now, one second. 
We have a question about once the application is submitted, how long does it take to receive a response? And so just so we're just so we're clear, it's not a limited waiver application. It is a um, it's the application for PSLF. It's just right now when you submit it, you're going to be reviewed under the waiver logic. But it's still the normal PSLF application that you're submitting and that you would that you that's how you raise your hand. And so how long does it take? It depends. If you haven't consolidated yet, then your consolidation has to go through first if you don't have direct loans, and that could take about 30 days. Um, for the PSLF form, if your employer is not in our system or it's coming up as likely ineligible and we don't know, then it could take longer because it has to go through adjudication. But if it's in our system, you have, you have the signatures, you have everything, then it should take about 30 days or less to get that process. But again, only if you've consolidated first or if you're already in a direct loan program. And also note, because we're switching from one servicer to another, there also are some delays there as well. So we're kind of in this weird period. Um, if we have someone who has worked for us full time for a couple of years already, and then decides to go to school and apply for loans, does this still qualify? So if they take out the loans after the waiver period, then their loans are gonna enter repayment after the waiver period. And so the time now wouldn't count. If they have loans right now, it would count for those loans. If they have, if they're in school right now for like grad school and they have undergrad loans, their loans are deferred. So they would have to opt out of their in-school deferment for grad school and then they could consolidate, um, but they would only get credit for the time where they weren't, when their loans weren't on in-school deferment and they were working full-time, if that makes sense. Um, these are, the, no, these are for all loans. It doesn't have to be for undergraduate. It can be for um, grad school loans. It does include parent plus loans, as I said. So PSLF is for all federal student loans. Um, this is a question about, do you have to be in the public service field for at least 10 years before you can qualify? Yes, you have to make 120 payments while working for a qualified employer to get credit. Um, the other options for forgiveness are income-based repayment plans, which have forgiveness after 20 or 25 years, depending on the plan and the type of loan. My loan has had different servicers since I started working for my current employer. Well, all the payments from all servicers, yes. It doesn't matter who services your loans, it just matters that you meet our PSLF criteria. Um, your servicer is not the, is not, um, does not determine your ability to qualify for PSLF. What if you're not 120 payments? If you're not 120 payments, you should still raise your hand, get your forms in and keep working. I'm not at 120, but I get my forms in and, and I look at it and I wait to see and I, and I get excited when I feel like I'm getting closer to the end. So even if you're not at forgiveness, even if you've only been in repayment for a couple of years or even just, you know, you just enter repayment, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and get on the right track. And when we come out of this payment pause, you wanna make sure you're, you're taking your best foot, you're making progress towards PSLF by getting on an income-based repayment plan and certifying every year or every time you change jobs. So that way you can make sure you are staying on track. Um, I have a question Actually, about working as a consultant. Sorry, what? Do you, want me to, do you want me to give you a question? I'm, I'm going through them. Oh yeah, sure. So there's a lot of questions about how to determine if your employment is eligible. Can you talk about um, book that and uh, changes we're making to make that publicly accessible? Yeah. So the best way is you're going to go to studentaid.gov slash PSLF, our help tool. And right now you do have to be a borrower and log into your studentaid.gov account. If you're a borrower and you don't have a studentaid.gov account, you should get one because studentaid.gov is the best place to go to manage your loans and get information about your loans. That's also where you go to consolidate. It's where you go to um, uh, sign up for income-based repayment and it's where you can do your PSLF form. Um, and so right now you log in and that to the PSLF help tool and you'll be able to type in your employer's EIN. You're gonna need that EIN, employer identification number for every single employer you wanna get credit for. And you'll be able to see in our system whether it's already in there as eligible or it has indetermined or it's not in there. So that's the basic system. We are also making that database public as of mid July. So you won't have to log in to use that. But in general, you can also, if you're checking to see whether it's a 501c3 or a nonprofit, there's also an IRS lookup you can use because again, our database is not um, all inclusive. It doesn't include every single eligible employer. We're constantly working to improve it. But those are the places you wanna start to determine if your employer is eligible. 
The next question is, can I make advance payments to, to qualify ahead of time to accelerate loan forgiveness? <laughs> I'm so sorry. You can make lump sum payments. Sorry, I'm gonna go off camera just a second because I'm about to check. Bonnie, you can answer. <laughs> okay, so um, so you, you can make lump sum payments up to up to the period for which your IDR plan is certified. So you can make, so if you have eight months left on your IDR period, you can make a lump sum payment to cover eight months of payments, um, but you still have to have the months of employment to count. So if you are eight months away from reaching 120 and you make a lump sum payment today, you still need to prove that those eight months, the, the next eight months you're in public service. So there's really not a way to get PSLF before you get to those 120 months. And actually, I'll wait for you to come up on camera again when you're ready for another question. Um, there are, I, the next question is, I checked into IDR, my total payments after 120 have been made, I would only have less than $2,000 forgiven, is it even worth it to me? So a couple things to keep in mind here, each, everyone's financial situation is different and I, I can't, I don't, I don't want to be too general, but I want to give some caveats. Um, the department has what's called a loan simulator that lets you do some math to figure out how much you'll get in loan forgiveness. Uh, the, the estimates about how much your income is going to increase are pretty I are five percent a year. I would love it if everyone's income went up five percent a year. That's just not the reality. And so we do allow you to adjust that. And so keep that in mind that the default settings are, are pretty generous about income growth. Um, the other thing is you never know what's going to happen. You, you don't know if you're going to have a, a change in your employment situation. And so it's really um, it's my recommendation is generally to get on track for it now so that you have all your ducks in a row. And if you decide you 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 know hit the lottery and want to pay it off, great. But if not, you've done everything you need to do. Um, Ashley, can you speak a little bit about contractors um, who, who about when contractors may or may not qualify for employment? Yes, and thanks, Bonnie. You're the best as always. <laughs> um, so remember, it's about the um, employer, it's not about the job. So if you are a contractor for a for-profit company, that is your employer, and that does not count for PSLF under current rules. So you would not be eligible for PSLF. If you're a contractor with a nonprofit or a state agency, and that's who actually pays you, because that happens, then you could qualify. But if you're con if you're the person who pays you is a for-profit company, even if you wrote, work side by side with people at a nonprofit or an agency, that doesn't count towards PSLF, unfortunately. Great. The next question is, I have seven loans out and I've been advised to not consolidate as my number of repayment, my number of qualifying payments will restart. Is this true? Under normal rules, yes, but under the waiver, that is no longer the case. And so if they're all direct loans, you may not need to consolidate because they may be all at the same repayment rate. But if you have some loans that are older that have, have qualifying higher qualifying payment counts, it might make sense for you to consolidate them because that entire consolidation loan under the waiver would get that maximum amount of credit for that longest loan and any other non-overlapping payments. So yes, that is the case under normal rules, but we're not under normal rules right now. This is what is being waived. You can consolidate, and some people have to consolidate, right? If you have a Fell or a Perkins loan, and you will not lose the credit that you've already accrued under the waiver, but you have to do it before October 31st, 2022. And the link to start the consolidation process is in the chat. And that looks like we've addressed all of our questions. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. I do hope, um, as Anna mentioned, we have employer toolkits. We have borrower fact sheets. Um, the toolkit has sample emails. If you could just help us out by sharing this on social media, blasting it out. If anyone there wants to put together a webinar, we're happy to come do a webinar for um, your networks and, and employees. We, are, we need everyone's help to get this message out so that our biggest fear that is, is that October 31st comes around and we haven't reached every single borrower who can take advantage of this. So please help us out. Um, in addition to all the incredible work that you already do, which we know is so impactful, please, please, please help us get this message out. And thank you so much for uh, your attention today. 
No, we actually think and Bonnie, thank you so much for all the, you know, the great job that you guys are doing, spreading the word and, and helping nonprofit employees uh, being able to, you know, to get some relief and and continue serving their communities and, you know, working, serving uh, people in need. So thank you so much. And and we're just very grateful for your time. And so um, if if there's anything that, that people need, um, we're going to um, share the toolkits um, and the recording of this webinar um, on, on a follow-up email for everyone who registered. But thank you so much, so much, Ashley and Bunny. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Um, so now we are going to um, we're going to get into our legislative um, update. Um, this was a, a great conversation um, uh, about the changes uh, to the PSLF program. But now we're going to change gears into what has been going on um, in Congress in June. June feels like um, it's you know it's it's been like a whole year on its own, and and so for that we have Wes and Jessica. Um, if you guys could share um, what is kind of like the latest on the hill, which which I, I, I again, it's it's a lot. It feels like we've been um, in June for probably two months already because Congress is running out of time and they need to address a bunch of things. And and definitely things happening at home and also abroad are just um, I mean, they just don't stop happening. So um, it's just great to have you guys and, and take it away. Yeah, thanks, uh, Anna. Um, good to be with you this afternoon. That was a good presentation from uh, Ashley and Bonnie, too, on the uh, loan program. So uh, I'll just kick it off and, and talk about the calendar, then have Jessica kind of go through what's what's happening. Just, just set the stage here. Congress is out uh, this next week for July 4th break. We're back for a few weeks in July, and then out for the month of uh, August, and back for about three weeks in September until the end of the fiscal year hits September 30th. And then we'll likely have a post- election, you know, end of November, into December, lame duck session, which really is going to be dictated, I think, mostly by what happens in the elections in November and how uh, willing they will be to do a uh, big end of the year package and what things are left uh, undone at that point. So that's kind of the setting stage for the calendar. But let me have Jessica kick it off and kind of talk about what uh, what's on the, uh, you know, kind of legislative uh, agenda for the short term. Sure. Thanks, Wes. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple different pieces that we're looking at that Congress is working on. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, I have to mention the Build Back Better Act and kind of how negotiations are going on there. Um, if you remember from last year, Manchin had some serious concerns about the size of the package and a number of the provisions um, that were um, passed by the House in the fall, um, and so had objected to kind of moving forward with the Senate kind of as the 50th vote um, to have it pass um, on the other team in, in the Senate. Um, and so as a result, all this year has there have been reports as far as um, potential negotiations and talks going on between uh, Majority Leader Schumer and Senator Manchin. Um, I guess the, to sum up here, um, you know, talks don't seem to be going great. They certainly are meeting with each other, but there's, uh, you know, still a number of outstanding questions as far as whether they can even get a deal and also on the spending side what will be included um so we know one that um you know if a deal is struck that it's likely going to be something much much smaller than what was passed by the house um last year um and the question is kind of what provisions could potentially get in um on the spending side it looks like there are a number of um issues such as climate change or green energy provisions that mansion is interested in as well as a prescription drug piece as well that raises um, some funds, um, as well as some changes potentially on the tax side to the international and corporate space that um, have been getting a lot of buzz. So we keep um, kind of looking at what is going on ahead, but certainly um, there's kind of a big question mark as far as whether things will move forward. I should say that there's been a lot of you know press lately. Um, rem remember that the reconciliation instructions they um, expire at the end of September, and so it really this is why you're hearing a lot of news in the press. Uh, really, the next few weeks um, you're going to hear a lot more as far as you know, hopefully getting to a deal um, sometime soon, um, because even even if a deal is announced, it needs to be, you know, if a bill is going to come forward, it would need to be drafted and all the kinks worked out before that September 30th date. So lots to kind of 
uh, unpacked there, but certainly something that we're watching closely. I think the takeaway here is, um, you know, I think there's a big question mark and every day it kind of seems um, more and more unlikely. So that's BBB. Um, speaking of deadlines, however, um, the House is also busy with a number of appropriations bills. Uh, remember, there are about 12 or there are 12 appropriations bills that need to be passed by Congress. Over the last several years, you've seen those um, not necessarily passed individually for the most part, but usually part of a larger omnibus plan is what we are packages that we call it um, to move forward. Um, a few days ago, um, the labor age appropriations bill, as well as the state and foreign ops um, bills were released or text was released by House Appropriations Committee. Um, labor age for, um, for those of you that are aware, it deals with um, HHS, education, labor funding. So um, something that I know um, IS and others um, watch very closely. Um, the Senate, on the other hand, is likely to move a bit slower on the appropriations front. Um, and so as a result, you know, it's, as I mentioned before, it's unlikely that we're really going to get all 12 appropriations passed bills are passed individually. Um, instead, I think there's um, more of a likelihood for some larger omnibus um, before the end of the fiscal year in September. So um, something to keep in mind. I would be remiss also to just also mention that Secure 2.0, um, the kind of uh, secondary retirement bill um, uh, for Secure 1.0 that was passed several years ago, um, it passed the House um, in March and a um, similar bill called the EARN Act was passed out of committee of the Senate Finance and Health Committees um, several days ago um, uh, with pretty much smooth sailing. I should note that there are some differences between the House and Senate bills. And so um, with that, it means that either Congress needs to do a conference committee to kind of hammer out those details, similar to what we're seeing um, with um, USICA competes, which deals with the semiconductor industry, um, or just needs to hammer out the details uh, kind of in an unofficial way and then pass and kind of the, the um, updated language. Um, given where things are for the year, um, a conference committee is pretty much not very, you know, not at all, um, I would say, um, very likely, certainly um, something where they hammer out the details on a leadership level and move forward um, uh, is more likely to move forward. Um, so stay tuned for that. I should say there are a number of provisions in there that potentially could affect the nonprofit sector, specifically um, the one, the main one that comes to mind is the legacy IRA provisions dealing with charitable rollovers. Um, the language is pretty similar for both the House and Senate bills, um, unlike other provisions that are included in the bill. So I should um, just note that um, as well. Um, Finally, I'll just mention um, or two more things is that, you know, we're getting closer to the end of the year, typically when Congress will move forward on some type of kind of end of the year cleanup bill, extenders bill um, to deal with a number of, you know, expiring tax provisions as well as other um, provisions on it left on its plate. Um, because the Build Back Better Act is kind of still hanging out there, we haven't really seen a whole lot of discussion as far as what an end of the year package could look like, but certainly something that for the charitable sector um, that y'all should you know, be aware of. Um, you know, that's in part because of just the importance of BBB politically um, for Democrats, um, but also there are a number of provisions that are in BBB or that have been discussed around BBB um, that if they don't get passed through kind of this larger reconciliation package, if this fails, could potentially move forward or be included in an end of the year package. So um, not so much for the charitable sector, but um, certainly R&D. Um, there's some provisions there with the R&D tax credit um, that folks have been looking at. Um, and so if it doesn't happen in BBB or when USICA competes, it means that it'll end up or likely something that um, will be discussed as far as an end of the year um, bill. One thing to note that is important for the charitable sector is kind of an extension of the temporary UCD provisions um, that were in the CARES Act, both increasing as well as extending um, that kind of um, above the line deduction. Um, that's um, a bill um, sponsored um, by Congressman Molerski, who's been a big supporter of the charitable sector. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as far as you know um, important provisions that may um, get put in there. Not a guarantee, but certainly something that we've heard folks talk about. Um, and then finally, I'll just mention, you know, you know, lightly that obviously there's a lot going on with the recent Roe v. Wade decision, and um, I know that a lot of your organizations have been really focused on that. Um, 
I won't go, really get into the state level, although there's obviously a lot of activity there on kind of both sides of the aisle. Um, I should note that, you know, with this year where we have an election season and for next year, it's certainly, um, you know, we're seeing that there's a likelihood that Republicans could take over the House next year. Um, one thing that um, uh, Minority Leader McCarthy has indicated is that there could be next year a 15 week or a ban after 15 weeks um, uh, potentially come up in um, the House next year. I note this largely, I think, to give you context as far as, well, one, something that could potentially come up next year, um, but also um, remember that the Senate is still very much up for debate or up for grabs um, in the midterm elections. And so one, we don't know if Republicans will take over um, the Senate next year, it could potentially still stay um, in Democratic control. Um, also, they would need a filibuster of 60 votes to pat and move forward with, with that. So um, if you, you know, you may see next year some movement on this piece in the House, um, but that's something to keep in mind just um, to kind of level set where things potentially could be. Um, I'll just stop with one last comment um, is that, you know, obviously uh, the next few weeks will be a lot of activity for Congress. Um, but once the fall hits, um, pretty much every member of Congress that's up for re-election, everyone in the House and about a third in the Senate, um, they'll be focused on keeping their jobs and going back and campaigning in their districts and states. So um, as far as the congressional side of things, you might see um, less activity there, but um, certainly a lot of activity on the campaign trail. So I'll stop there. And if Wes has anything else to add, um, uh, that's it for me. No, that was great uh, update, Jessica. Appreciate that uh, uh, going through all those issues. I think you know, the overarching theme here, I think that we've talked about is that uh, outside of the reconciliation bill, anything that must pass or will pass must be bipartisan, right? To get 60 votes, at least in the Senate uh, to pass it through. So that really kind of think, narrows down what we think is gonna happen between now and the election, and then obviously it's going to be all eyes towards what can they do in a larger package in lame duck in the November, December uh, timeframe. Things where a lot of the action activity will likely be geared towards. No, thank you, um, Wes and Jessica, for that update. I, if people have questions, please put them either in the Q and A um, box or in the chat, and and we'll take a look at them in a minute. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, clearly uh, there is way too many things that Congress has to address uh, before the midterm um, elections and then also before the um, September 30th deadline for the reconciliation um, process. So um, I would say like, what are, I mean, how, for example, in the case of the um, EARN Act um, and, and the possible conference that committees need to go do, um, what can we all be doing to ensure that, of course, our priorities, uh, like the legacy IRA, definitely get into the the final, um, you know, bill that passes Congress. And same with uh, many of of the provisions that that we're following, like expanding um, the temporary UCD and also the ERTC. Um, what what is kind of um, the, I mean, what can all we be doing knowing that this is an extremely busy year and Congress, um, it's running out of time? Yeah, good, uh, good question, right? So I think that we see the next, you know, couple of months, from the Democrats' perspective, focusing on the reconciliation bill and see if they can get that done by September 30th. I think they, you know, uh, most people give it low odds that it'll actually get done, but you know, my view is that there's still you know, a possibility they could find a way to get a narrow package through the Senate with Senator Manchin's blessing that meets his criteria, but definitely uh, it's a tall order and he's not uh, been uh, easy to come along on getting a deal as we've been working with, they've worked with him for you know, 10 months now. So that's gonna be the focus I think, from a Democrat's perspective. Um, and then it's really going to be what can they do at the end of the year? Uh, for example, the pension bill is very bipartisan, passed the House 400 plus votes, passed out of the uh, Finance Committee uh, with you know, support. Um, I don't see it going to the Senate floor in the next uh, two months, although I think if it, if it did, it would have uh, broad support. I think the Senator Schumer just has a limited amount of time for Senate floor debate for that. and. Uh, one of the issues with a tax vehicle is it attracts other things to be attached to it and on the Senate floor uh, that could bog it down. So I think the thinking for the pension bill is that um, at some point 
uh, in the end of the year becomes part of the conversation to get it passed either as part of a larger uh, uh, negotiated deal in December, or I think it does have support to pass it by itself at some point at the end of the year because it has uh, broad bipartisan support. But I think the most likely route for it to get done is to be tacked on to a broader uh, tax and spending package at the end of the year. It's fully paid for, uh, no need for offsets. And so it kind of you know, has a uh, bipartisan support and meets all the criteria. There's not a controversy about, uh, about the offsets and that, that sort of things like there, uh, there's a good chance it does get done, uh, not in the short term, but by the end of, end of the year. Um, you know, other things that get done, I think are gonna have to be bipartisan, right? Uh, I don't see the Congress passing any appropriation bills to the president's desk uh, by September 30th, maybe, you know, legislative branch or some of the very non-controversial, easy uh, bipartisan ones. But for the most part, I think they're going to be uh, mostly have to rely on a CR to push the debate beyond the elections into November before they come back and deal with the appropriations process. So we'll have a lot of things, I think, to uh, deal with at the end of, end of the year. Yeah, and I'd say, Anna, in terms of just, um, you know, making sure that your, you know, priorities stay aligned, um, definitely make sure that you're going to kind of your champions or, or you know, or, or uh, senators or representatives where you have, a, you know, a large footprint, either of a lot of uh, activity and work that you do for your charitable organization, or in just terms of the number of employees that either work or live there. Um, that's really important. I always tell clients, you know, I think it's important to stay away from the theoretical and you know, really focus on the tangible. So, you know, it's not about the importance of the charitable sector or the importance of the charitable sector to democracy, although very important. Um, you know, really it's about, okay, how does, you know, for example, the Legacy IRA Act, how is that, you know, why is that important for your organization? Do you get a lot of charitable contributions that way? If these changes move forward, you know, what would that, you know, allow you to do? What have you thought about that? I think, you know, really getting into like, what is it that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, that really resonates with staffers more and it, I think sticks in their heads. No, thank you, Liz and Jessica, for for I mean those those great uh, tips and pointers of what can possibly get done this year and and what's the best way of making sure that these things are top of mind and and are in the minds of our our legislators. Um, we have received a couple of questions. Um, one, um, um, I think it's she, it's from Lori. She asked um, if we expect um, the payments for direct loans to be postponed again. Uh, what about the possible ten thousand um, dollar loan forgiveness? Um, what what have you uh, been hearing on the hill about this? Yeah, that's a good question. It kind of fits in with what you've been talking about. I think there is two issues where they're fairly separate, right? There's a broad uh, student loan forgiveness issue that you have the Democrats pushing, President Biden pushing some you know, uh, set amount, 10,000, 3,000, whatever it is, uh, of overall loan forgiveness. And then you have the student, you know, the public service uh, loan forgiveness program, which I think is, is very bipartisan or support to make tweaks to that and make it more uh, us usable. I think in the former, the broader uh, uh, loan forgiveness piece is unlikely to uh, garner bipartisan legislation in the Senate or the House to be able to pass. So it's really gonna be up to the president and the administration to be able to do what they can do on that. You've seen from the Department of Education on the student, the public service side of things, they're taking action uh, to make that program also uh, more uh, usable and, and helpful, which I think was very, very positive. There are some bipartisan bills out there to expand that, make some tweaks to it, but you see some changes there. Um, but I think they'll probably be uh, more modest um, in, in, in scope, and there is support on a bipartisan basis to fix that and make that program uh, work. And so I can see some of those uh, reasons. The question I don't know if they'll move by themselves, or that would be something that could be done uh, as part of the year-end package in, in December. They need to kind of I think, separate out two, I think, from, from, from what can get done standpoint. There's definitely broad support, bipartisan support for the student loan, uh, public service piece, and just the you know flat dollar amount of forgiving everybody's loan to have student loans. I think there's a lot of Republicans who oppose that. I don't see uh, 60 votes in the Senate to pass up into that uh, broad uh, forgiveness uh, nature. Thank you, Wes. So yeah, that, that goes in line with um, a question from Mark. Um, he asks um, if there are any known opponents on the Hill to the loan forgiveness program. 
like I said, right? Like I said, like the, the Republicans are uh, generally opposed to a broad-based uh, forgiveness uh, piece um, that you know the President Biden, Senator Schumer, others, Elizabeth Warren are, are pushing. And so I just don't see you know CD votes, you know, ten Republicans in the Senate voting for something like, like that uh, at this at this stage. Indeed. Um, another question that we have is um, if there are any op updates on the ACE Act. A yeah, good question. There are not any uh, new updates, uh, no new movements. I haven't seen if there's any even new co-sponsors on the, uh, the Senate bill. Um, the lead uh, uh, Republican on the House bill, uh, Congressman Tommy from New York, New York uh, retired and left Congress. So that bill is without, um, uh, you know, he's no longer there. So uh, I've not seen any new movement or changes there or support or other uh, recent uh, activity on that uh, issue. Indeed, yeah, I think that's the latest we also um, seen. Um, so no, I, I think this this has been um, a, a great and um, very complete um, June special policy update. Um, uh, we we are thrilled that we were able to um, host Ashley from the Department of, of Education. Um, uh, please uh, let us know if you have um, any any questions. Uh, we're going to send out an email um, to all registrants with a recording of of the webinar and also some uh, fact sheets and materials uh, that Ashley shared with us. Um, this has been a, a great, a very insightful. Um, I, I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about um, the recent changes to the program. And also um, June, again, it, there's been tons of things going on on the Hill. And as we move into July and then the Agos Reese's, um, it is more important than ever that, that we get our priorities um, in front of our champions to ensure that as we go into fall, um, there are continue to be, um, you know, in, in their minds um, as they move into the midterm elections and campaign season. So um, I wanted to thank Jessica and Wes for all your partnership and, and insights. Um, and if there's anything else that, that you guys want to add before we close. I'm good. Thank you so much. Uh, good to be with you. Thanks, Jessica. If you have anything to add, last comments. No, thanks for having us. Thank you, guys. And thank you, everyone who joined us. Um, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks.